Sir, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Ganga. Good morning, Dr. Naresh. Hi, Tarek. Good morning. Yes, we're just uh, yeah, waiting for Sanji. Let me just do it. Hi, good morning. Dr. Sanjeev, are you able to share your screen now? Yes, Sarjat. I am okay now. Okay, so... Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We still have one minute, so thank you so much. And I really apologize for the technical glitches because, you know, <laughs> we are doing it for the first time and uh, it's little... So we'll wait for another one minute. You all can settle down. No problem, Dr. Naresh. Ashish is taking care of your presentation. And Dr. Sanjeev and Tarek, you will be managing your slides, right? Yeah. You have the share option, everything okay? Yes. Yes. So should we start? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hmm. So dear... Um... Dr. Harjut and everyone, I think the first one to present is me, right? Uh, wait, wait, uh, Tarek, I'm going to introduce and uh, I'll just let you know. So uh, I think we lost Dr. Naresh. Uh, please, with the interpretation, let me just check. Ashish, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah, can you just coordinate? We are not able to see Dr. Naresh. Can you just coordinate with Pooja? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so with this, I think, uh, should we wait for a while, for a minute? Dr. Ganga, what do you think? Or should we start? I know you have so much on your plate today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He dropped off. I think we should start because it's already 11.30. So good morning, everybody. And uh, in times of COVID, it is indeed amazing that we are able to get together. Okay, Dr. Naresh is also back. And uh, maybe it's virtually, but I hope very soon in the coming years, we all get to meet physically, interact with each other, be in a room and talk about things, at least shake hands. So I think uh, we are all missing that, but uh, inshallah, very soon by next year or something, we will be having it physically and uh, delivering no matter what, you know, so and delivering in difficult times. So COVID has taught us many things, many things like we were able to maintain our services. We were able to do shopping. I did it online. So we were able to eat good things. Everybody became a cook and everybody reached out to communities who needed the most you know, we, uh, we were able to respond effectively, efficiently to all the women, young people, children who we have been working for. So with that note, I thank you all for being here today. And I welcome our panelists. 
And to start with, I, I would uh, take the honor to introduce our moderator, Dr. Raman Ganga Khetkar, you know, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ganga Khetkar is former ICMR Indian Council of Medical Research Scientist who was recently conferred with Padma Shri Award. And the Padma Shri Award is the th third highest civilian honors of India. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ganga, we are so happy to have you and thank you so much for coming today and taking our time for us. I will just say a few things about you. Dr. Ganga is currently working with World Health Organization. He's in the expert group which is probing the origins of COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Ganga has played an immensely important role while he was working with ICMR in handling the Nipah virus outbreak in Kerala in 2018. Dr. Ganga has also been head headed the NARI National Institute of Virology <coughs> in Pune. And he has been a guide mentor for everybody who has worked in the field of HIV and tuberculosis. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganga. With this, I also take an opportunity to introduce our, you know, star-studded panel. And uh, let me start with uh, thanking Dr. Naresh Pratap for, you know, joining us today. Dr. Naresh is currently heading, leading our Family Planning Association of Nepal. And he's, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Naresh has worked with government of Nepal in various capacities. He's, he has more than uh, three decades of experience where he has led health program across Nepal, Sudan, Indonesia, South Africa, while he was working with World Health Organization also. In government service, he has led various aspects related to planning, development, implementation, management, leadership, and managing complex programs and the capacity building, conflict prevention, strong technical support, and excellent networking skills. So thank you so much, Dr. Naresh. We are very happy to have you. And uh, moving on to Dr. Sanjeev, and uh, it is amazing to you know, introduce all of you, and I'm really overwhelmed right now. And Dr. Sanjeev is Executive Director for Family Planning Association of Bangladesh. He has more than two decades of experience in public health and development sector in Bangladesh. He has worked across donor and implementation agencies. His core areas include quality assurance, capacity development, training, program management. He has an expertise in managing multi-million dollar projects related to maternal, neonatal health, adolescent family planning, sexual reproductive health rights, and nutrition. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev. We are really looking forward to your presentation. And last but not the least, our dear friend Tarek, who, who has been working in Afghan Family Guidance Association, as we you know, call it, AFGA. And uh, Tarek has uh, been managing the SPRINT project, which is Sexual Reproductive Health Program in Crisis and Post-Crisis Situation. And SPRINT is an initiative designed to address gaps in implementation of minimum in initial service package or the MISP package that we call it IPPF for reproductive health, which is a set of priority activities to be implemented at the onset of an emergency. So thank you so much, Tarek, despite so much happening in Afghanistan. Thank you so much for taking out time and joining our panel. And along with me, I have my colleague Ashish, who will be supporting this session along with Shanuki, who's here to support us if we go crazy. So with this, and uh, I request Dr. Ganga, if you want to start, you know, please guide us in some few kind words from your end. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Khosa. Uh, this Dr. is something, Khosa, uh, it's a privilege to be part of uh, such a discussion. I recall my earlier days when the outbreak started first in China. When the reports came, I recall that we started very early. We started on Jan 11, and then subsequently, if you recall, we detected the first case on 30th of January in India. We always used to think that it will not hit us because SARS and MERS would be stopped. Uh, before they spread across as imported infection. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And the lockdown was started on March 24th when the numbers of these cases started increasing. And that posed 
many challenges, not only for uh, reproductive health, for any programming that we thought of. Then the entire country, if you recall at that time, was in a state of any fear at that time. You know, everybody thought as if there was only one enemy, that was COVID-19 against which we had to fight. Fortunately for us, in India, one thing which worked was we had programs that were old enough and here in India, you have health as a state subject. So there were depots of every kind of supplies that we had to make at regional level. So essentially what we teach us that healthcare infrastructure becomes an important issue. And since the depots were located close by, the fear that there will be access, lesser access to these, uh, uh, these utilities which you require was perhaps not existent at, at that point in time. But one has to also understand that on the other side for COVID diagnostic kits or whatever supplies we had to make, we had to actually even use, uh, we had to go for airlifting because this was a time of lockdown, everything had closed down. And there also for lockdown, uh, during the lockdown, we had to use Indian Air Force because the rest of the commercial uh, airlines had stopped functioning at that juncture. And naturally, it increases the cost of supplies because he, he, even the supplier cannot provide these, uh, uh, these supplies so easily. And the reason perhaps was that we could still maintain that was we excluded those industries which were from where we used to access supplies for a variety of things from lockdown and they continue to work at that juncture. But at the same time, the scare among people was so high that people were unwilling to come out and try to seek care even if they had health problems. And naturally, even for preventive kind of aspects in the initial period, it was very tough. You know, people never used to come forward so easily because there was a fear that one may acquire COVID-19 if they go out and not only they themselves, but they could pass it off to their own family members whom they love so much. And perhaps, you know, some of them may succumb to this infection. Naturally, in those circumstances, similar fear was also there among healthcare workers, but healthcare workers rose to the challenge really well. Because one thing which government of India also did was we offered insurance for them. And also every protective supply was made available. Those supplies were less in numbers in India at that juncture. But we promoted industries, we brought them together and tried to handle that issue so well that there were certain issues like PPEs, the N95 masks, which were not produced in uh, uh, India as much we managed to produce that uh, significantly. Now, what is also important for us to understand, right? you know, NGOs, uh, NGO sector uh, had also its own challenges because NGO sector is a vibrant, uh, vibrant uh, companion for any program for that matter. But when the fear was very high, even for them to organize themselves to deliver services was extremely tough. There were some self-help groups, which, if I recall correctly, within first six months, they came out and started working well. And like those in HIV programming, people living with HIV infection, mainly because they had to access care. They had to go to the ART centers and try and get their own tablets. And they thought that their own peers should also get it. And they sought government support. And that's how that provision also continued to occur. But at the same time, we, we, we need to remember one thing. You know, when these things tend to happen, do we mean to say that we manage to provide similar quality or similar level of care for other diseases or other programs? Maybe perhaps not. You know? uh, we need to remember at the current challenge is to try and move ahead and try to negotiate whatever we can do and try to restore the earlier level of programming that we had. We need to, we need to recall that we also had a comprehensive programming in place within a couple of months' time. We started with teleconsultations for almost all diseases, including COVID. 
and that helped a lot because we could at least manage them at homes uh, even the even the diagnosis of covid we had to send people to their homes for taking the nasal swabs and diagnose whether they are infected what is also important is this particular infection the pandemic was first of its kind for most of us because it occurs once in almost 100 years we have learned certain lessons now it is time that we need to we need to ensure that we document them so that the subsequent generations know how to fight against it india was not the only country that was facing problems at that juncture almost all countries now you will perhaps hear about uh, nepal from dr naresh and dr sanjeev will speak about bangladesh dr tarek will speak about afghanistan each country had its own own plate full of problems that could be related to healthcare infrastructure the people's response the supplies related issues and how they could maintain continuity of those services and it would really be nice to hear from all these very well experienced people the kind of problems that they faced and how they tried to overcome unfortunately today because of some emergency i may have to quit a little early then i would have it in my side but um, uh, i wish you all all the best to uh, deliberate on the challenges that you faced and how they were overcome thank you thank you so much dr ganga for your you know motivating words and of course for your useful insights and we totally understand that in time such times you know emergency is now a common word <laughs> and uh, being a covid survivor myself i really you know feel that uh, you know i i was able to get the support i needed but still you know it's been 6 months i'm unable to breathe and uh, i still get a lot of side effects so i'm really you know hopeful that we will all you know make a stronger communities and a stronger countries and a stronger south asia level response for covid so thank you so much dr ganga thank and you and with this yes sir. and all our you know our webinar is full of people and we have a good audience and to begin with uh, dr naresh we request you if uh, we can have your words and your experience of leading fpan during difficult covid times so over to you ashish thank you harshad ji thank you very much good afternoon everybody i am really honored and uh, proud to be in this session and be sharing the same platform with uh, uh where dr ganga is uh, chairing is a padma shri award that's real honor for us to be in such a platform and he has made my job easier because he has actually explained the scenario so explicitly that my presentation doesn't need to explain <laughs> how the no, situation no, no. happened <laughs> so uh, i think i'm um, thank you very much and I, dr ganga i hope i will meet some day and congratulations for you for, for your you. padma shri award thank you Uh, can somebody uh, yes. share my slides please yes i am going to share here yeah. can you see uh, harjot can you please confirm if you can see the slide yes, yes perfect i can see yeah. i can see uh, ashish ji can can we go to the next one please sure sir family planning association is uh, always always the government asks us to go where the government cannot go and we, we nepal is known for disasters be it flood be it earthquake and we are always there with our services in the front line you know we have the first people to go and serve the people as for the covid also we are the first ones to go and uh, i would like just uh, with the statistics i want to play a total number of uh, positive people is 818 till date recovered 799 and uh, as per our government resources uh, statistics they say that almost 35% of the uh, population has been uh, immunized uh, by two doses of vaccines that's a quite a good achievement and now they have started 12 to 18 group also with vaccinations and i think that's a very good uh, start for the government and we can boast about it and uh, as you know that first coast uh, case was diagnosed uh, in nepal that was in 23rd january and then from from 23rd march 
the lockdown happened till 23rd of September. Next, please. Well, uh, we work in clusters with, with all the donor agencies and uh, people who are working, uh, working in disasters. We have a RH subcluster group, of which we, after, after the COVID was announced, we worked with them and we prepared a disaster a preparedness plan and response. And uh, we also work with the uh, large anonymous donor consortium, WHO, PSI, MSI, FAN, and prepared a work plan and we also uh, thought of having telemedicine for these uh, hours and seekers. Next, please. Next slide, yes. And uh, we, we oh, use the social media, uh, mm -hmm. be it national papers, uh, be it television, be it TikToks and other things uh, to, to uh, make people aware of the uh, situation. And FM radio radios are also very widely used. And in the meantime, uh, RMNSH uh, guideline was endorsed by, by the Ministry of Health. And that, that gave us a, a working, uh, working guideline to work with uh, people with, uh, uh, people with uh, COVID affected people in the, in the communities. Next, please. As you can see that there are some pictures shown here and we, 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 we essential uh, sexual liberal health services uh, continued even during the lockdown. However, in the beginning, most of the service delivery points were closed, but within the few days, uh, once we, we had our PPEs, uh, we had our PPEs, we had a mask, we had uh, logistics all secured. Then we started providing services from our clinics from our uh, CVDs, from our uh, mobile teams. And even then, the, the services, uh, if you see that uh, for that period of time, uh, period of time last year, the services decreased by 27%. Even then, our, our workers uh, ne never took, took a day, day off and they were working hard. And uh, here I, I need to mention that uh, most of our uh, health workers working are, are now fully vaccinated and uh, around uh, even though vaccinated around 15 percent of our staff had uh, covid infection and they they had to rest also next please uh, these are some pictures to just to show you how, how people were working and uh, family planning association of nepal uh, is provides uh, vaccination services to the new uh, to the children also and uh, the people feel that vaccination has a good quality and the cold chain is maintained. So we have a, a people rushing to this, our clinics. Uh, so many people come to our clinics and they waited uh, during this COVID uh, lockdown also when uh, we, we, our clinics were closed. They waited to us to open. So we, we, we now have a, a line of uh, uh, kids coming to our vaccination sites and family planning commodities and other services. Next, please. And resource mobilization, as you can see, that is, uh, uh, we, we received uh, from uh, Sprint uh, 40,000 US dollars. And then uh, in 2020, we received 75,000 US dollars. And from Saro Business Continuity Fund, fund we did, uh, received $9,000 uh, from GCACI project. Uh, we received ten thousand dollars. UNFPA thirteen thousand dollars. Japan Trust Fund eleven thousand dollars. We had some internal funds also generated. We use that also, and some uh, social uh, social organization uh, CSR Good also came up with, with help and provided us uh, with uh, donations. Uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, support for uh, for funding and the respond project is now is. We have 809,000 9, US dollars project that will be uh, working with uh, uh, essential SRHS services in the new, new mechanism, new delivery mechanism. Next, please. And promotional activities, we, 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 we had lots of pro, uh, promotional activities produced in local languages. Uh, and uh, this was widely and television scrolling uh, was used during that time. And now also we are still using uh, the television scrolling. FM and uh, radio's messages are, 
about the essential SRS services during and after the SRS services. Also, that is also uh, for uh, broadcasted from the uh, radios and televisions. And television talk, talk shows also is organized um, at times about our SRS services. Next, please. Well, just before going to our interventions, uh, I would like to just uh, a background of family planning of Nepal. Family planning of Nepal is one of the oldest uh, MAs, uh, 59. Uh, it started in 59, 1959, and it's one of the oldest. And we, we uh, FPAN started uh, providing family planning services before the government did. And 10 years later, government took over the family planning services. So that is our history. So I just wanted to boast that, you know. And uh, digital intervention is a must during the uh, COVID times and new pandemics. I think uh, digital interventions must be used and radio and TV programs uh, were launched. We provide mobile set to our uh, volunteers and, uh, and they, they were providing services also. And helpline services have started since April. And these helpline services uh, are almost, uh, is, uh, they, anyone can, uh, call in, ask about their problems, and uh, describe their problems, and and these people will guide them where to go or what to do. This this will be done, and we have been giving opportunity to roll out RS guidelines through uh, through through our networks, you know, and we we get this funding from UNFPA, and we have been implementing teleconsultation services in 13 districts with UNFPA support and self the self delivery apps in six districts. This is also being widely used. Next, please. Uh, our experiences was that uh, mobilizing community volunteers for door-to-door -door services is very useful and safety with safety measures is very useful. Uh, PPP, PPEs were distributed to frontline workers to continue the services through clinics. Integrated messages uh, were uh, broadcasted and this, this will help them. And the helpline service, as I've been, as I, as I told you earlier, uh, is is still there, and I think we we are planning to uh, continue that. And in our next proposals, also we have been uh, writing about a helpline uh, helpline uh, project. Next, please. Well, the challenges for us were were that uh, for us it was very difficult to organize program physically. Yes, uh, it was very difficult, and mobile camps we could not conduct. And uh, sexual, uh, uh, the comprehensive sexual, uh, sexual, sexual education classes, both formal and non-formal settings were very difficult to conduct. Difficult to monitor, uh, monitor the program during this COVID-19 program. And as I've told you earlier, our services uh, were decreased by 27% and uh, CYP by 10% due to pandemics, pandemic. Our partner organizers said that their services were decreased by up to 70%. Uh, even uh, we, we, we are better off. I just wanted to tell you that uh, some of our partners had a drastic uh, reduction in their services. Thank you. Next, please. Well, uh, the good practices uh, during COVID was in case, uh, engaging with RS clusters. And I think this has been uh, proved to be even during the earthquake and even during the large floods, we, we are working with the cl clusters and th this really uh, helped us and to channelize the funding and, no, and, uh, and not to clear duplication. This was a very, a very good, uh, uh, very good uh, part of planning, you know. And uh, we rapidly did a feasibility survey uh, for this uh, CSC trainings and uh, te teachers training were organized. And virtual training programs were also uh, organized. Uh, and now we have this hybrid model of virtual training also. And uh, CSC sessions are now being conducted through national televisions. Next, please. Well, the, this, this was the pamphlets we did develop for this, uh, uh, for, 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 for the COVID uh, pandemic and for preparations. So the, the, you get, in one of them, you can see the helpline numbers, in others, how to react, uh, how, to, how to interact with patients and all. So the, this, I think this is my last slide. And thank you, for, thank you very much for bearing with me. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Naresh. And, uh, you know, the line that I loved uh, at the beginning of your presentation was, uh, we go where government cannot go. And uh, coming from you, who has worked for nearly three decades in the government, and now you are in the completely opposite, where you are, you know, at the, you know taking the flag bearer for CSOs and communities. And also, like few points which I really uh, thought that it's important is like the bi-directional strategies, you know, while using TikTok and social media, you were reaching out to the urban communities, whereas with FM radio and all, FPEN was reaching out to the rural communities, which is very important. And I think that's a good example to take up. And also when it comes to like, you know, our frontline workers actually fought the war. war and having uh, procuring PPE kits at the right time so that they are in the field and their safety is ensured. I think that was the most important step in COVID, which mo most of us took. And I think that's how we supported our warriors. And lastly, <clears throat> when we talk about leaving no one behind, so online comprehensive sexuality education sessions, I think so the kids, children, adolescent, young people who were sitting in their homes, they were able to continue to engage and continue to talk about their issues. So that's wonderful. And thank you so much, Dr. Naresh. And I really enjoyed your presentation. We do have some questions, but we will take it at the end, if that's okay with you. And uh, yes. And with this, I request Dr. Sanji, and we are, uh, you know, from Bangladesh, where I know vaccinations reached in July, you know, later than all other countries and how Bangladesh has been striving with the COVID and with Dr. Sanjeev, who will bring the perspective of both working as a donor and now as an implementer. So we are really looking forward to your presentation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Harjitji. Uh, I am really honored to be part of this session. And uh, let me share my screen. Yes. Is it visible? Yes, yes, you can just do it on, you know, slide share mode. So I am on slide share mode. Um, it's not fully opening, you know, like, um, can you just, uh, have you clicked on this small uh, slide share mode? Yes. In the presentation mode. Presentation mode, yes. There is some black spots coming on. I don't know. Can you just close and maybe start again? You should do window share. Now, uh, are you trying to go on the presentation mode? Yes, I am in the presentation mode, mm -hmm. but here I can see that your screen sharing is paused. Uh, paused? Let me just... Mm. No, I think... Uh, should I share your presentation if there are some... I can try sharing if there are some please. technical glitches. Please, please. I'll do that. My, in my, on my screen, it's open. Can you stop sharing? Okay, you yes. have stopped sharing. Yes. Are you able to see your presentation, Dr. Sanji? Yes, yes. Okay, so we can do go then. Ashish, everything is okay with the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Everything is fine. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Sanji, please let okay. me know. Okay, the next slide. Okay. Uh, here I am. I am going to share the um, uh, the old situation Bangladesh has faced during COVID nineteen out outbreak. Bangladesh was uh, one of the worst countries in South Asia in COVID nineteen outbreak. Key factors contributing to the severity of the outbreak includes limited and pro poorly equipped hospitals, inadequate testing facilities, lack of awareness, inadequate knowledge, and uptake of guidelines, poverty and precious employment 
precarious employment situation. Bangladesh healthcare facilities have encountered huge challenges in treating patients since the outbreak of COVID-19 due to the restricted mobility of the population, not fully operational and limited facilities and significant lack of resources which has resulted in a critical scarcity of essential SRA services. This has resulted in a dramatic raise in the unintended pregnancies, gender-based violences, and child marriage across the country. The initial findings of IPPF's COVID-19 impact survey in March 2020 for Bangladesh indicated that within the first few months of the pandemic, a sharp increase in the sexual and gender-based violence cases are reported. A May 2020 survey by local human rights organization, Manusha Juno Foundation, reported more than 50,000 women were physically, mentally, and sexually abused, with nearly 4,000 faced with financial constraint and imposed by their husband. UNICEF estimates that disruption of health services during COVID-19 may have contributed to an additional 200,000 child and 11,000 maternal deaths in South Asia in 2020. Children in Bangladesh remain out of school due to pandemic control measures. The report warns that the significant number of children are likely not to return back to school and uh, are at particular risk due to the deterioration of excess of SRH and information services. Next slide, please. With that backdrop, FPB promptly adjusted their delivery to support women and girls needing critical sexual and reproductive health services and HGBV care through 21 static clinics, 75 mobile units, 72 family development centers, three special work units, and about 1,000 reproductive health promoters. All our service providers, uh, uh, service delivery points remain fully functional and our service providers are working relentlessly even during the worst attack of COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Here is the uh, countrywide network of, of Family Planning Association of Bangladesh. Family Planning Association of Bangladesh works through 21 branches countrywide in 21 districts of administrative districts of Bangladesh, including one hilly district. There are 21 static clinics, 75 mobile clinics, three special work, uni work units, 72 FDCs. FDCs are family development center. Uh, in other words, we call it women, women's club led by uh, solely women. Uh, I have mentioned that we have about 1,000 RHPs uh, who work in the government demarcated areas of Bangladesh and uh, 21 Tararmela. Tararmela are youth led platforms where youth learn, grow, and uh, uh, they, they, uh, they acquire their leadership skill uh, from this platform. So, all these service delivery networks were uh, fully operational during the whole period of COVID 19 pandemic. Next slide, please. We have ensured uh, the safety of all uh, of our staffs at all level. We have ensured PPE and uh, we have uh, got some support from the uh, uh, Canadian fund, uh, that is uh, uh, Canadian fund and the Spring fund, uh, and also got some support from Pathfinder International to procure these PPEs. And we have incorporated mandatory infection prevention in all our service uh, delivery centers, dedicated vehicles for all stops for pickup and drop to and from home, and prohibited office attendance of staffs who could do their job online and work from home. So with this mechanism, we have ensured the safety of all our uh, staffs who work relentlessly. So next slide, please. Uh, at the same time, we have taken some measures to stop spread of disease uh, among our clients. We have incorporated provision of regular disinfection. I have mentioned that and all workstation and vehicles even. 
ensured hand washing, uh, use of mask and temperature measurement facilities for attending clients and visitors. And we have ensured separate entrance and exit for clients at all service delivery points. And we have also incorporated a triage mechanism for clients who uh, represent uh, with uh, COVID-19 symptoms. Next slide, please. So thinking the necessity during this pandemic, we, uh, the whole country went under lockdown. Uh, and even afterwards, there were imposed local level area specific lockdowns. Clients were in fear of attending the SDPs in person. Even in many instances, they did not allow our reproductive health promoters to visit their homes. Considering the overall situation, APV felt an obvious need to expand access to no-touch services and self-management of SRH care. In this regard, APV has started operating hotlines in all 21 branches and started piloting of low-cost telemedicine services as well to provide online consultation and services. Those who wanted to get the services from their home felt comfortable with these initiatives. For demand generation uh, of this telemedicine and other DHI services, uh, we have uh, and promotion. We have uh, uh, used the different social media like Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, and with digital contents. APV also hosted certain digital media campaigns on different bonding issues like stop child marriage, stop uh, HGBV throughout the pandemic period with the technical support of RNTC Media, Netherlands-based RNTC Media under Global Affairs Canada funded project. APV also incorporated online CAC session for in and out of school youths and adolescents. Uh, um, uh, we have a dedicated session uh, on it, uh, the online CAC tomorrow at the same, same time, today's time. Next slide, please. Uh, as, uh, as a part of the DHI, APB hotline services has been uh, designed and decentralized with eight divisional hotline, number, numbers in, uh, integrated with 21 APB branches with a medical officer and counselor in each. Medical officer and counselors provide HGBB support and SRH telecounseling and services using the hotlines. APB also works through the government helpline for managing HGBB case, cases when needed, all 21 APB branches use the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs hotline for extra support due to the high numbers of reported HGBV cases. The hotline is integrated with specialized assistance through the door-to-door -door services by APB reproductive health promoters. Survivors and, uh, and their in-laws are counseled immediately where possible during the uh, during a situation where at-home counseling is not possible, uh, the service provider referred those clients to APAB uh, clinics. An assessment checklist, uh, assessment done through a checklist, and uh, uh, they determine, uh, our service provider determine how, uh, what kind of uh, support the survivor need. Uh, the survivors are counseled and uh, uh, our medical staff treat for the physical violences. For cases of sexual violences, survivors, survivors are sent to government hospital for uh, collecting samples and testing. Survivors requiring legal assistance are referred to NGOs to ensure uh, there is protective justice for cases. We all, all know that integrated HGBB care is vital for women and girls. Efforts must be multifaceted to ensure survivors get the essential care they need. APB has implemented mass awareness campaigns to build local level advocacy through the door-to-door -door service and individual counseling with clients and in-laws. Comprehensive outreach screening for HGBV survivors done by our RHPs and at clinic by the counselors. This approach enables easy access to emergency HGBV services with legal, financial, other referral services where, uh, where appropriate. APB has trained and built capacity of local advocates and gatekeepers and staff and partners. APB has a specialized, a specialized screening for mothers experiencing violence during pregnancy. 
providing those most vulnerable with financial assistance and nutritional care. Next slide, please. The telemedicine application is a digital solution uh, that helps the client to connect with registered facilities through reportive health promoters. This is actually a uh, teleconsultation facility uh, with, with uh, the video, video teleconsultation facilities. Uh, where, where the uh, admin supports registration of the doctor and the reportive health promoters during a client visit in communities, RHPs arrange the video teleconsultation using their Android de devices, uh, mostly tablets. Those who are interested in talking this video call with a minimum minimum payment uh, has given the services instantly. Keeping into consideration the government willingness and support to the private service providers to take up telemedicine as a, as a comprehensive service delivery model. APB is implementing the following model, the picture uh, here I am showing in the slide, keeping the current guidelines into consideration and abiding by the current rules of the government. The model is being piloted is uh, one of our 21 branches and APB uh, has planned to scale it up in other four branches in 2022 through different mechanism to cater the needs of the most vulnerable population. Next slide, please. Here, uh, some uh, glimpse of the uh, service promotion. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed two strategies of, uh, on field by maintaining COVID-19 safety application. We have uh, the provision of hand micing about the safety pre uh, precaution uh, we, kept, uh, we have uh, kept uh, APB static clinic during government restriction uh, lockdown period. And we have also developed leaflets and other brochures uh, for uh, this service promotion. And we also use the digital platform. Uh, we uh, developed several videos, uh, video clips and other contents, IC materials to, to promote this using the social media. Uh, I have mentioned that Facebook, WhatsApp, and YouTube, uh, and, and also uh, through um, uh, other online means. And uh, we have reconstructed our website for uh, easy uh, uh, use, uh, user-friendly uh, uh, protocol. Next, next slide, please. Here are some service statistics. Uh, up to date, we have received uh, more than 39,000 uh, hotline calls. And uh, regarding HGBP telecounseling, we have uh, received 710 calls uh, from the service seekers. And uh, we have uh, referred 75 clients uh, for, uh, for better uh, healthcare. Uh, and uh, we have uh, provided financial support to six clients uh, receive the indirect financial transport, financial support and transport uh, support from our network. Next slide, please. Here, uh, uh, a couple of testimonials from our clients. Harjot, uh, uh, can you uh, can you click on the play the video? Okay. I am sorry that sound is not uh, clear. Uh, actually, there are uh, probably some technical uh, difficulties. But uh, here are the two testimonials from our clients who got uh, direct support from our uh, service delivery network. Next slide, please. We have faced some uh, challenges uh, implementing this DHI um, uh, during this COVID-19 period. Uh, uh, we all know uh, during the lockdown, there are limited access to emergency GBV services. The government support helpline uh, slowed during the pandemic with a lengthy procedure. Uh, those who uh, reported sexual violence at the district level, uh, 
there are limited knowledge of clients who have to go, who have to receive services, inadequate funding support uh, for the SGBV programming, survivors seeking immediate support could not be referred to uh, for laboratory investigation because we all know in lockdown situation, many uh, service delivery uh, points were uh, remained closed in government and other private sector uh, uh, facilities. Uh, high demand of people needing services, the doctor were even answering calls at home, uh, and a mobile connectivity was also uh, um, scrambled during this whole pandemic period. The cost uh, are uh, the the, the uh, call cost are to the client. Uh, right now, uh, we are operating uh, the hotline through a through Grameen phone, not through the national uh, telephone uh, hotline number. Uh, so we are st still struggling. For getting the national number, but uh, still now call costs are implied to the client. That is a challenge. Uh, that was a challenge for uh, implementing this hotline. Next slide, please. Uh, lesson learned: uh, uh, We need to allocate more fund for uh, more promotional campaigns or promotional activities. Uh, dedicated national toll-free number, which I have mentioned earlier, uh, for uh, free call is critical for HGBV care. Need to ensure 24-hour service uh, available. Uh, right at this moment, our clinics are remaining open for eight, uh, eight hours a day only. But uh, if we could uh, provide services around the clock, that will be uh, um, uh, great for us. Uh, need to assign personnel for DHA management. Uh, that is our perspective. We need to assign a dedicated personnel for our DHA management. Next slide, please. Our future plan to upgrade the, our uh, DHA services. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the plan to uh, upgrade our uh, telemedicine services from web-based application to a, a app-based application. Um, and we also want to procure some low cost uh, end terminals like e stethoscope. You can see the uh, some uh, some pictures of the low cost end terminals. Uh, these are e stethoscope, e ultrasonography probe, e ECG machine. So with that uh, low cost machines, we will able to provide a uh, full range of telemedicine service in future. Incorporating EMR, electronic medical record for maintaining useful client, uh, uh, client records. And uh, with that, we will link our ECMIS with uh, our uh, web-based reporting system, DHIS2. At present, FPB is using a third-party server for telemedicine and has planned to produce, procure and dedicate uh, server, uh, procure a dedicated server for DHI. Thank you all. This is all from my end. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjeev. And, you know, just to say that telemedicine hotline services, WhatsApp, you know, in my, I think that this is the future. And especially, you know, as IPPF, as family planning associations, we are building, you know, our feminist agenda. And, you know, with so much gender inequalities and uh, COVID has, you know, all the like, um, COVID has again given a verdict that we need to step up now when it comes to, you know, gender-based violence or intimate partner violence, because strong measures or something, you know, has to be done at grassroots level. And it is amazing that, you know, with Bangladesh being so badly hit by COVID, all the 21 clinics and the, you know, all the responding service delivery dispensing structures were open. So that's, a, you know, like... Cheers to Bangladesh and your leadership. Thank you so much for your presentation. We do have some questions, but we'll come after Tariq's presentation. So with this, you know, I request Tariq, if you can please take us, walk us through your experience of how, of course, uh, Afghanistan is uh, dealing with a lot of difficulties and it's not new. You have, you and your team have been going to the humanitarian settings and all. So we really are looking forward to your presentation. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Arjut. Um, <clears throat> at first, I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, greetings, everyone. And I'm very happy and delighted to uh, present uh, 
my presentations, uh, which is a Sprint Emergency Response Project that we have uh, implemented in Afghanistan during the COVID-19 pandemic. And with saying this, I would like to appreciate uh, IPPF Humanitarian, IPPF SARO, and more importantly, DFAT uh, or Australian Aid for supporting us through these uh, difficult situations. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. So I would like to share my uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> we can see your presentation. You can go on perfect. presentation mode. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank you. So like I said, the presentation uh, is the Sprint Emergency Response Project that was uh, implemented in 2020 and 2021 about the exact dates I'm going to discuss later on. And uh, uh, this was mainly uh, uh, proposed to be implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is Tarek Farman and I'm project officer at Afghan Family Guidance Association. So uh, during this presentation, I'm going to take you to different topics. The first one is the introduction. Uh, I'm going to introduce the project and uh, the ground reality that existed, and also the design of this project, um, how we plan to ensure that the SRH services are uh, continued during these difficult times, and also uh, we are going to discuss about the uh, types of SRH services that community outreach midwives provided at community level. Uh, please note that the COM uh, is the abbreviation of uh, community outreach midwives. And uh, also, like we are going to talk about the, the achievements and also the challenges. And at the end, we are going to have the question and answer uh, session. Uh, so in the introduction, um, uh, at first, it's important uh, for me to discuss about the ground reality, uh, what existed in that, uh, in that time. Uh, we all know that Afghanistan, mostly the people are suffering from financial, uh, financial problems. And uh, under these circumstances, when COVID-19 occurred, so there were different other restrictions that happened. And that made the... Uh, poor people or the average people of Afghanistan to face like financial problems. And these financial problems made the, uh, the people in Afghanistan not to prioritize uh, SRH services during this pandemic. So uh, there were some other, imagine the people who were dealing with their, uh, how to prepare their meals, their, their upcoming meals. So this uh, uh, like, giving a portion of their financials uh, to, uh, uh, to family planning or to SRH services. This was something hard that we predicted. And also um, on the other hand, like MOPH was uh, allocating all it is additional resources to uh, COVID-19, not just to uh, SRH services. So uh, we wanted to prevent uh, and uh, provide SRH services during these difficult times. So this uh, project uh, we implemented through two stages. The first stage was from uh, 10th April uh, 2020 till December. So it was a nine month uh, uh, project with having a one month uh, a no cost extension. And on the other hand, we really appreciate again, the donors, the respected donors uh, that were mentioned earlier, like uh, we had the cost extension from 1st March to the first August for six months. And then uh, there was like at that situation, uh, the uh, health workers were not keen to provide services, unfortunately, some of them, not all of them, of course. So uh, uh, like um, Dr. Nar uh, I think Dr. Um, Ganga said previously that uh, uh, mostly some of the uh, the people were worried about like this diseases of COVID-19 in order to infect other relatives. So they wanted to provide this one. So in general, uh, some of uh, the health workers uh, that were not keen uh, to provide services, then they get a, a, um, 
uh, like the MOPH uh, warned them that if they don't continue their jobs during these difficult times, we are, we are not going to allow them to work after this pandemic. So there were many challenges such as lockdowns, uh, like commodity shortage and people's fear towards COVID-19 and also transportation res restriction. Uh, since Afghanistan is a country that is mostly importing the, uh, all the items, uh, including the uh, like medical uh, commodities and also like uh, other commodities from other countries, especially neighbor countries. So since the other neighbor countries were also suffering from such uh, diseases, so there were some transportation restrictions as well. And uh, then people were, uh, people were worried about these uh, health centers. They were looking health centers as frontline for COVID-19. So they were not like, uh, uh, how can I say, enthuse, enthusiasm towards uh, attending or towards uh, visiting health centers because of COVID-19. And in this situation, IPPF and AFGA wanted to uh, find a solution to provide SRH services during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So the design of this project, uh, so this project was mainly to uh, continue SRH services during pandemic. And uh, uh, for this, AFGA uh, communicated with IPPF and suggested to provide uh, 50, like a higher 50 community outreach midwives in four provinces uh, of Afghanistan, which was mostly populated provinces, and they had the most positive cases of uh, COVID-19. So at this stage, uh, AFGA planned to, to give uh, 100. Uh, 77 clients per month for each uh, community outreach midwives that was uh, like uh, 8,850 uh, clients per 50 community outreach midwives. So this was their monthly target. And um, apart from providing HIV uh, and STI counselings and also like family, uh, family planning uh, methods, they were also supposed to provide uh, clean delivery kits that we planned at the onset of the project, uh, like uh, to procure uh, 500 uh, clean delivery kits for visibly pregnant women. And also like uh, there is the sub kit B of clean delivery kits for birth attendant who uh, 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 just in case if they are attending any uh, home deliveries, so they should be equipped. And uh, also we, uh, during this project, we uh, plan to procure commodities for eight static clinics at four provinces of Afghanistan. So this is the map um, that our static clinics uh, existed during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic through a Sprint Emergency Project. So it was in Kabul, Ningarhar, Balkhan, Herat. So uh, there were eight static clinics in, the, in these four provinces. And also the community <laughs> outreach midwives, they were like, uh, we hired uh, the uh, clinical in charges as their supervisors. Of course, in order to uh, get in touch with our community outreach midwives, we tried to maintain different platforms to, in order to answer their questions or queries if they have or any support. One was through the uh, community supervisors through static clinics. On the other hand, we plan to uh, create a Viber group and add all the community outreach midwives there. And we had the uh, representative of a uh, program department, uh, like m and &E department and other relevant departments in that Viber group, just to provide any answers or respond to any queries or um, like, uh, needed things for community outreach midwives than when they raise. So the type of SRH services that were provided by community outreach midwives at community level was, uh, they were providing FP general counseling, family planning general counseling uh, for, uh, uh, for the clients. And of course they were like providing short-term family planning uh, at community level. And uh, they were referring the clients who were in uh, who were selecting the long-term family planning method uh, to Afghan static clinics 
just in case if Afghan static clinic was very far from their uh, community or remote area, then uh, if there was any other static clinic, uh, clinics available, storage clinics available, they were referring to that one as well. So on the other side, like um, uh, uh, the community outreach midwives, they were referring complicated cases to our static clinics or governmental health centers. And also they were providing HIV AIDS or STI or RTI uh, counselings in terms of risk reduction for uh, the clients. And also they were providing GBV counselings and uh, uh, they were like referring the high uh, cases of uh, GBV survivors to family protection centres uh, uh, that, uh, that, that was uh, uh, supported uh, by uh, uh, gender directorate of MOPH. And also, uh, uh, like they were providing uh, SRH sexu uh, sexuality counselings and also, like I said, uh, contraceptive services, and they referred for uh, long-term uh, uh, methods to our aesthetic clinics or any other uh, clinics that were available at their nearest. And also, they were providing um, information on danger signs of pregnancy and some other key uh, SRH uh, informations. And uh, of course, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there were like clean delivery kits that were procured and they, uh, it was distributed among visibly pregnant women at community level. So uh, this is the picture of our community outreach midwives. Uh, they were very supportive and they were sharing these uh, pictures on uh, our Viber group. And we were using it after taking their consent, we were using it in the, uh, our reports and also in some presentations like this. So the community outreach midwives, along with a brief information about the, what um, uh, was happening at that time. So the, and here the community outreach midwife is providing the counseling uh, regarding the method and also like she's providing contraceptives. And also we equipped our community outreach with midwives with IACs, so they had brochures with themselves. The brochures and the IACs or posters, they were focusing on COVID-19 topics, on uh, uh, danger signs of pregnancy and danger signs of newborn, and also uh, like some other uh, nutritions that were effect uh, effective for uh, COVID-19, such as like taking vegetables and uh, avoid handshaking, maintaining distances, so these were the topics that were covered in IEC. So in this picture, Afga's uh, community outreach midwife is interacting and uh, providing counseling regarding all the methods and unwanted pregnancies and like um, uh, all the methods for un avoiding unwanted pregnancies and also COVID-19, they were like uh, briefly oriented by our program team in terms of what sorts of things they should uh, uh, prov uh, counsel. They, um, the clients uh, as per WHO guidelines and as per uh, MOPH guidelines in here. So in here, uh, our community outreach midwife is uh, checking the blood pressure of um, a woman, uh, one of client who is uh, like uh, uh, pregnant and uh, the midwife is providing <coughs> counseling regarding eclampsia as well for pregnant women. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, Clean delivery kits, like I said, it was distributed among the visibly pregnant women in remote areas, especially those uh, visibly, visibly pregnant women who were uh, uh, like uh, thought that they might be have difficulties in attending any health centers during the uh, visibly uh, during the uh, uh, birth. So in 2020, the clients that we reached was 2000. 229,105 uh, 229, uh, people, uh, both through our static clinic our, and our uh, uh, community outreach midwives in four provinces. And uh, we um, fortunately could manage to distribute 500 clean delivery kits uh, among the visibly pregnant women. And uh, via our uh, um, like uh, community outreach midwives, we managed to uh, like visit uh, 66,172 clients uh, and uh, at their doorsteps in four provinces of Afghanistan. So this is the chart. In this uh, part, you can uh, see the 
uh, achievements via uh, quarterly base. And um, so, like I said, the total number was uh, 229,105 uh, uh, clients that were reached in 2020. And in 2021, uh, when we were in the second stage of cost extension, uh, fortunately, like we could uh, overachieve our uh, targets and that was like really helpful uh, for the people as well. So mostly uh, uh, if you see the, uh, the uh, achievements is disaggregated by months and, uh, and we have the targeted per month, which was 25,395. And then there was the achieved parts. So uh, for, uh, fortunately, like mostly we could achieve uh, uh, more clients that we than one, what we were planning. And then here it is the graph uh, that you can check. The uh, blue one uh, shows the target and the uh, green one shows the achieved uh, uh, like uh, clients, thanks. And then there is the uh, chart for um, uh, sprint community outreach midwives. Remember the previous one was the static clinic. So in here it is like the community outreach midwives con uh, sessions that were conducted. So it is uh, disaggregated age-wise uh, and also like uh, uh, fortunately at this point also we could manage to like uh, overachieve uh, what we have planned. And you can check it here through graphs easily, like each month. And then these uh, colors indicates the disaggregated age wise that we have reported to IPPF. So mostly like the age of 20, uh, 25 to 49 uh, at this age, like mostly our clients were from this age. And um, this is the chart that uh, indicates the uh, target versus achieved uh, clients. And um, in here, it is the graph that we can see, like uh, the target is the uh, blue one and the achieved is on the green side. So uh, in the first uh, month of each project, mostly like, we have to procure items or we have to hire some uh, other uh, community outreach midwives or any staff. So that's why the first uh, month was like a little bit underachieved, but uh, the, on the other months, uh, fortunately we could overachieve uh, uh, to reach to the clients that we want, what we have planned already. So there were, of course, some challenges that we faced during the project. And um, especially uh, when uh, we had one month of a standby during these uh, two stages uh, on February 2021. So it was a little bit hard to fill like community outreach midwives on the remote areas. Uh, so this was one of the reasons that also made us to and that achieve on the first month, but overall we have fortunately overachieved. And then of course, there is the procurement of medicine at the onset of the project. So um, this is something that is a bit challenging uh, because we, uh, we need to like uh, plan it very uh, correctly because uh, mostly during these pandemics, we can face like uh, Tarek, can you hear us? Have we lost you? Tarek? Uh, Ashish, am I, is my screen frozen or everybody's frozen? No, no, I think you are correct. Uh, his uh, connection is lost. So okay, let's wait so, for one minute. Maybe he would yes. reconnect. Yes. So maybe, uh, meanwhile, I can start up, you know, putting questions. If that's okay, and we can wait for Tariq to come back and finish. Uh, yes, Tariq, you know, maybe oh, really? you can conclude it. No problem. You know, we are also running out of time. Maybe you can give a concluding remark. And then we have questions, you know. Coming. Yeah, sure. Um, it is like 
almost the same. Yes. So the infection was the challenge. Uh, even some of the family members of uh, the uh, community outreach midwives were like infected to COVID-19. And one thing I want to uh, uh, explain is that one of the appreciation we got from the MOPH was like they said that Afga was the only NGO that provided SRS services during the first round of COVID-19. So that was a very success moment uh, when we presented our services during uh, uh, MOPH or RMNCH meetings. So uh, Afga was the only uh, NGO that was providing SRS services during uh, COVID-19 round number one. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate you all for your patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tariq, you know, and uh, being in uh, such critical situations and prioritizing uh, sexual reproductive health services and rights, you know, really a lot of respect to Afka team and your, you know, initiative and vision. And also whether it's, you know, having clean delivery kits or uh, uh, it is really overwhelming to see the midwives in action. So thank you for sharing those photographs. And with this, you know, we just have five or seven minutes left. I'll be very quick, but we have lots of questions. And to begin with, uh, Dr. Naresh, you know, we have a few for you. So you have shared that uh, during COVID, there were door-to-door -door service delivery, you know. Can you just share example of what were the kind of services or which services were prioritized for door-to-door -door delivery? I, can you hear me, Dr. Naresh? Yes, I, I can. Can you give me all the questions so that I can quickly answer okay. it? Okay, uh, yes, yes. And also, you know, what was the, you uh, as your presentation shared that, you know, promotional activities uh, were undertaken. What was the impact of those uh, promotional activities? Did it increase the service delivery, service uptake? And lastly, you know, what do you think as, uh, you know, as Pan, what has COVID taught us? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Door-to-door uh, -door, uh, uh, providing, uh, these were basically commodities. We are just uh, distributing commodities to door-to-door -door services. Uh, basically, this was in, in the remote areas mm -hmm. and to, to those disadvantaged com communities. And promotional activities really help the people to seek awareness and comfort services. And this was very good. And what COVID, COVID taught us was that, you know, uh, we don't need to work from office all the time. This was one of the things that we learned. But uh, Having said that, I do not want to, to have all the time the Zoom meetings. I think Sarah should organize some <laughs> physical <laughs> meetings as well so that we can meet and shake hands, like you said in the beginning. Otherwise, yes. otherwise uh, these Zoom meetings are very, very, you know, yeah. uh, very, very tedious and not good enough. At least we, at times we can share the greasy food that that uh, Saro badly served, oh no, <laughs> badly served food, pushing yeah. into each other. You know, I am missing all that. <laughs> yes, and uh, only the difficulty was uh, providing uh, surgical services to the patients, uh, the clients during these times. Otherwise, other services were provided, and I really liked uh, Sanjeev's presentation, saying that he is uh, going up to e e stethoscope e. e ECG and other things, and then I think uh, uh, the world will be a, a better place with, with that and provide e-services to, to the people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Naresh. You know. So Dr. Sanjeev, we have a few questions for you. Should I just go all at once? To begin with, you know, was, uh, there is a question that was there a mass migration across border and inside Bangladesh and how did it affect COVID-19 pandemic? And second one, in your presentation, you shared that, you know, so many young people were, had to leave their schools. So is there any intervention by government of Bangladesh or by the civil society, you know, organizations to bring those children back to schools? Yes, just these two. Okay, 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 Th thank you. Uh, regarding the migration, uh, 
uh, actually when lockdown in, uh, implemented then uh, there was no migration but but before that there are uh, numbers of uh, lots of people going uh, back and forth from uh, across the border so uh, uh, there were uh, uh, increased risk of uh, spreading the infection countrywide and you know uh, dur during the uh, second wave uh, uh, the the new variety uh, uh, spreading of new variety uh, solely uh, by the people who migrated during this COVID-19 uh, period uh, uh, from them. And uh, uh, your second question is, uh, yes, got school, uh, schools are closed and we have faced lots of problems uh, uh, providing sanitization to uh, school children, uh, school going adolescent and youths. Uh, um, uh, and we, we, we have work, uh, overcome that challenge uh, implementing the online uh, sessions uh, uh, for, for the school going uh, adolescents and youth. But otherwise, government has uh, 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 given the online uh, curriculum based uh, mm -hmm. session to, uh, to them. Uh, there are online classes uh, in many schools, uh, mostly in urban areas, but in rural area, uh, the children face really a pro uh, great problem. There is no uh, online uh, class uh, system in the rural area. And other CSO, they were uh, also provided, uh, um, as per their program needs, and they provided the online-based support to the school and out of school adolescents and youths. Thank you so much. Dr. Sanjeev, and uh, it is, uh, you know, we still have a long road ahead. And uh, with right. this, uh, Tarek, we have just a few questions for you that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the community outreach midwife model, you know, is a very promising model. And the way you have explained, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you shared that, uh, you know, community outreach midwives used to go in the field and take sessions. Can you elaborate on what were the thematic areas covered in this session and how did people take these sessions? Yeah, um, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, the community outreach midwives, they were ought to go to the remote areas and provide uh, uh, these SRS services for poor and marginalized people. And um, with that, with saying this, like they were going door to door and like uh, mm -hmm. knocking the doors. When they wanted to cover the sessions, they were like uh, providing GBV counselings, um, okay. especially uh, like, uh, of course, they were ma maintaining the confidentiality. Yeah. So uh, Afga department, program department, they uh, suggested them to mm -hmm. Like when they are providing the services, they should make sure that it is in a separate room and uh, to in, in order or just not just separate room or just to make sure that uh, they are only alone with the client and uh, providing these counselings. And in case if uh, there is a uh, serious case, they should refer it to family protection centers where they can uh, get uh, broader uh, like uh, services uh, regarding GBV in there. And also they were like providing uh, uh, HIV and STI uh, counselings in terms of risk reductions. As you know, unfortunately, Afghanistan, they also ha uh, they have some uh, number of uh, people who are addicted to some drugs. So mostly uh, those types of people, uh, when uh, the clients uh, were claiming that their husband is addicted, so the community outreach midwives were making sure to provide uh, HIV and STI uh, uh, counselings in terms of risk reduction. And if uh, the client was having like uh, some of the symptoms of HIV or STI, uh, they were referring it to Afghan Static Clinic or NACP uh, clinics, which is uh, which stands for National AIDS Control Program. It is part of uh, the Department of MOPH. They have uh, clinics uh, across the country. So uh, the, uh, the clinics were already introduced to community outreach midwife and they knew that uh, for some of the people who were having the HIV symptoms or um, like uh, STI, then they were referring it to NACP clinics. 
Apart from that, uh, the community outreach midwives were providing the short term or short acting uh, family planning methods, such as like oral pills, uh, including CUC and PUP, and also like uh, the injectables and uh, emergency contraceptives, also uh, male condom. And uh, for long term family planning methods, they were referring it to our uh, Afghan static clinic. We provide uh, uh, like uh, or uh, implement IUDs and implant uh, as a long-term family planning method in our static clinics and uh, also like the community outreach midwives were providing ANC and PNC uh, services to clients at remote areas and also they were like uh, uh, providing counseling uh, regarding the subfertility as well for the uh, clients who were suffering from um, any subfertility issues yeah Thank you so Thank much, you. you know, and um, any last words from anyone? I think we had a very good and detailed presentations and with it, we have come to an end to our session. And uh, so I really want to thank all the, you know, panelist members and our moderator and my colleagues. And thank you so much for coming today together. And now the only way ahead is that we are all together. We have our digital health interventions. We have our community outreach midwives. We have our social media. And now we are here to change the world. So with this hope, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for all the participants who were here, who viewed our session, who were together with us in this journey. We hope we were able to share as much as possible. And we'll continue to do that. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Admin, you can stop sharing, uh, stop streaming now. Who is this? Is it uh, Shubham or Pooja? Who is room one admin? Hello? Hello? Hello, room one, who's in the room? Host, who is the host? 